Okay, so five o'clock in my clock here. So I would like to start this since this is a time bound uh, webinar that we have uh, done today. So yeah, good evening everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this discussion on uh, how to handle departmental audit. We have a lot of guests coming in. Manasa, my colleague, uh, if she can help me to you know, allow everybody into the meeting, I will start off with the discussion. So before I start off, we all believe that handling departmental audit is a art. I thoroughly second that thought. It is definitely not a science. Uh, even though we believe that a lot of things can be explained through the law, there are a lot of things only as a person you can deal with while uh, presenting yourself before a proper officer. With this opening remark, I would like to start off the presentation. Uh, I hope the presentation is uh, visible to all. I've just put on my presentation. So what we will be trying to do today is I've been given one hour of time in that I'm only allowed to speak for 45 minutes and I'm uh, supposed to take up a Q&A for last 15 minutes. So in my 45 minutes, uh, I will try to cover various aspects uh, with regards to the departmental audit, uh, which is covered by Section 65 of the GST Act. Before we get into various aspects of Section 65 of the GST Act, which uh, covers the act, you know, departmental audit, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, bring on slight few aspects as to what are the different kinds of audit which are possible under that. While dealing so, few of them uh, could look like it, uh, it is obsolete because we are dealing with uh, 22, 23 now, whereas uh, uh, the audits which are going on now from the department side is covering from 17, 18 onwards. So you have to bear with me because uh, some of this could be applicable for the audits which are going on. We all know there are uh, three types of audit which are covered under the whole of the GST law. One is section 35.5. It is what is called as GSTR 9C. We loosely call it as a GST audit by the professionals, uh, which is which could be conducted by a chartered accountant or a cost accountant. We also know that this has been omitted from Finance Act 2021. That means currently when we are doing for 22-23, which just elapsed, there is nothing called a GST audit from a chart accountant or a cost accountant. It is a self-certification uh, to be done by the uh, registered person himself. Prior to uh, omission of this Finance Act uh, from the Finance Act 2021, a chartered accountant was required to certify the GSTR 99C if the turnover was beyond 5 crores annually. This is one type of audit. Why am I stressing on this? For the period for which the audits are getting conducted from the department now, right from 17, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20, 35.5 was in vogue. That means the 99C which the departmental officials would be going through would be certified by a chartered accountant or a cost accountant. The second type of audit, which is the topic for discussion today, is the departmental audit. We will definitely delve into this more because that is a topic for our discussion. So the second kind of audit is the department audit conducted by the officers. The third audit is something called a special audit. This is very interesting. Even though it's not a topic for our discussion today, a couple of minutes on this. What is special audit? A special audit again is an audit conducted by a professional, a chartered accountant or a cost accountant. Keep in mind, during the course of departmental audit, if the department feels that the case in hand, that is the registered person in hand is very complicated or they're not able to move forward in the case due to various things mentioned in section 66, I'm not delving too much into it. In that particular case, they can always call for a special audit. That means they, the commissioner or the joint commissioner can appoint a chartered accountant who is impaneled with the state or the central authorities. And that particular impaneled chartered accountant or a cost accountant could be asked to conduct the audit on behalf of the department, give a report, which is again similar to how the department audit would get conducted. Based on the report by the chartered accountant or the cost accountant, the final uh, you know, decision would be taken on the observations made. These are the three types of audits which are uh, you know, covered in the whole of the GST law. The topic for our discussion is the second type of audit, which is the departmental audit, which is conducted by the officers of the department. Before we get into audit by the department, we have to understand what is an audit. Thankfully, the law in section 2 bracket 13 of the CGST Act defines what is an audit. It is very crucial for us to understand what is an audit because all of us here could be chartered accountants or may not be chartered accountants, but from the you know assessee side or the registered person side would be dealing with a lot of chartered accountants or cost accountants. We have come across this term called as audit. Our understanding of audit could be very different from the way it is defined under the GST law. For our understanding of the GST law, we have to understand audit because this is the scope of 
the departmental officers under section 65 they cannot go beyond this they can always be within the limits of the definition defined in section 2 bracket 13 so let's understand what is an audit it is quite uh, uh, large and wide but we still have to understand what does it include the definition of audit it it says uh, it uh, audit means examination of uh, records, returns, and other documents. So now we'll have to understand what does records, returns, and other documents mean. We know what does records mean. Records are the records which are required to be maintained under the GST law. In my subsequent slides, maybe three, four slides uh, from here now, I will be uh, explaining you what are the accounts and records which one needs to maintain under the GST law. And that's the four, you know, that's the boundary within which uh, the records would get prepared by the registered person. And that's the boundary within which the department has to conduct its audit on the records which is maintained under the law. The returns we all know, which are the returns covered under the GST law. We understand, even though we may not dwell too much into it, but we understand GST are 1, 2, 3, 3B, 9, 9C are the returns. But you have to keep in mind that the returns which is uh, covered under the law is what is covered under section 39. Section 39 covers GSTR 3B and GSTR 1 and GSTR 2, which is not there today, but GSTR 1 is still there. GSTR 1 is not a written. GSTR 1 is only a statement of outward supply summary. It is nothing beyond that. It is only a annexure to the monthly return in form GSTR 3B. So we have to understand that GSTR 1, which we file on month on month basis, is actually not a return specified under the GST law. It's only a statement of my outward, you know, outward supplies that are made during a particular month. This is for, important for us to understand because returns does not cover GSTR 1. Returns covers for our general understanding GSTR 3B. So when they mean returns here, it is 3B filed under that and other documents. We will understand what does other documents means uh, a little later. So now audit means examination of records, returns and other documents maintained or furnished by the registered person. Mind you here, you have to keep this in mind that what is subjected to examination are the records, returns and other documents which are maintained and furnished by you who is the registered person. It is not the document which is available to him as a third party evidence. It is not a document available to him through maybe they have done, done a summons or a state. They have taken a statement of my vendor or a customer not relying on that. What is subjected to audit are the records and um, uh, returns and documents maintained by me, which are required to be maintained under this act. A little glitch here. If you look at the th fourth point here on my slide, it says under this act or rules made there under or under any other law for the time being in force. That means the records, the returns and other documents which are maintained and furnished need not be only under the GST law. It can also be under any other allied laws. It could be income tax law, it could be company's law or it could be any other law for the time being in force. That means if I've given any documents or records or returns under any other law also, that could also become the document which could be subjected to audit under the GST law. Why is all this done? The objective of the GST audit by the department is to verify the correctness of the turnover declared, the taxes paid, the refunds claimed, and the input tax credit availed. So also keep in mind the last para, which is a very important because it broadens and enlarges the scope of the audit by the department. It also says to verify or to assess the compliances with the provisions of this act that the rules made there enter. That means it is not only to check whether your turnover which have declared your annual returns or your monthly returns is correct. It is not only to check whether the taxes that you have paid is correct or not in the returns. It is on also not only to check whether the refund applications you have filed through RFD 01 is correct or not. That means refund is sanctioned correctly or not. It is also not only to check whether the input tax credit has been availed correctly or not in the returns. It is also further to ensure that all the compliances which are required on the GST law has been correctly maintained and done. That means something which is nothing to do with numbers can also become subjected to audit to ensure the compliance is made. If not, that could always lead to a penalty, could be general penalty or a specific penalty spelled out in the law. So you have to keep in mind before an auditor asks you something, you'll have to ensure that the scope of the audit is known and also check whether the details which they are asking for are the details which are required for him to conduct the audit under the GST law. So I've just drawn this table or the uh, probably a chart 
to tell you how the process of the audit is generally conducted. Where does it start and where does this uh, lead to and how does it get concluded? The audit always commences with giving us an intimation of commencing the audit in ADT1. So we also know that whenever an audit gets picked up by the department, how do we get to know? That's only through the means of a form called as ADT1. ADT1 says that our case is picked up for audit. It also says that for which period is the audit to propose to be conducted. And it also says that where do they want to conduct this audit? It could be at his desk or it could be at my premises. So all of this information forms the forms part of a form called as ADT1. Without ADT1, a audit cannot get commenced by the department. On ADT1, the audit officer would ask you to submit a list of documents which are required for him to go through as part of the audit. That generally is an annexure to ADT1. So the annexure to ADT1 mentions what all details he is calling for as part of the audit. The responsibility of the taxpayer is to go through the list of the documents he called for and submit those list of documents to the officer either at his desk or make it available when he comes for uh, a review of the documents at my premises. So that is the subject, that is the second uh, second uh, thing which I have put on slide. That is submission of documents, post submission of documents, the officer will go through the records, review the records, make his observations, ask for clarifications, which could be uh, in the form of maybe additional documents, or it could be form of uh, you know clarifying on certain aspects, which is not able to understand through documents and many things like that. So on submission of documents and on review of the documents which have been submitted, the audit officer will make up his audit para. A audit para is basically an observation which is made during the course of the audit, which he feels is required to be communicated to the taxpayer to say that why the taxes on particular aspects are not paid or why the credits have been claimed which he believes is ineligible or why refund which has been granted to you he believes is not eligible should be retained as such. So all this could form issues of audit observation. So that means he will communicate an audit observation, which is a draft report to me to reply uh, to get a reply from me saying that why that should not be forming part of the show cause notice subsequently. So this is the first opportunity given by the audit officer to me to explain my case to say that why the paragraphs made as part of the audit should not be considered subsequently to issue a show cause notice. So here the only requirement which the audit officer is seeking from me is a response from me to say his observations whether I believe it is correct or not. It is not that I have to give a detailed response to substantiate why what he is saying is wrong. He is only trying to say this is what I believe through the verification of various documents. Tell me your views on each of the observations. Once I give my response to each of the observation, what he does is concludes the audit. How do I know whether the audit is concluded or not? He will issue something called as ADT2. ADT2 showcases that the audit is concluded from the audit team. Once ADT2 is issued, the ADT2 will say the final audit report points which have been made by the audit team as part of the audit. This is after issuing the audit observation and getting responses from the taxpayer. So once the ADT2 is issued, if there are any points which are still not acceptable to the department, by default that will get into the show cause notice. That means the ADT2 will lead to a show cause notice for paragraphs where the department is not convinced that those should get dropped at this level. So you have to understand that if ADT2 has any open points that normally leads to a show cause notice. Now whether the show cause notice could lead to a section 73 notice which is a normal situation or section 74 notice alleging that I have evaded the tax payment is only depending on the paragraph which is made by the audit team. This is the gist of the process which is carried out as part of the audit. Now we'll have to delve into each of the situations to understand what all could come up at the ADT1 stage, what all could come up at the submission of the documents and review stage, at observation stage and audit stage, ADT2 stage. So now let us understand who can do an audit because it's very easy to say that department can conduct an audit. But now how do I know whether the right person is coming to me to conduct the audit or should I challenge this saying that he is not the right person, so he should not be commencing the audit at all. We have to go back a little bit now to 2017 when the GST law was introduced. It was a common fear when the GST law was introduced. We, we know that there was something called a state jurisdiction. There was something called a central jurisdiction. And we all had the common uh, fear saying that 
what if both of them try to exercise jurisdiction over me that means can all of them exercise jurisdiction that means state officer can come and do audit can center also come and do audit should i be answerable to both of them at the same time or not this confusion was there initially so thereby the gst council had multiple rounds of discussion on this to understand how can we split the assessees into state and center obviously the government also doesn't want the a center as well as the state to exercise this jurisdiction on on the same taxpayer then it leads to say doing the same activity twice by two different uh, you know authorities thereby they issued something called a circular 1 bar 17 to assign the taxpayers between center and state how did they do this it's very very theoretical and academic we cannot even go back and question how did they do this whether this was rightly done or not the table which is there on the slide explains the criteria based on which you were either fitted into a central jurisdiction or you were either fitted into a state jurisdiction can we validate this not possible can i know where do i fall under definitely yes when if you were a person who got migrated from the old law there was a circular 1 bar 70 17 which we spoke about it had an annex here to say whether your gst number was falling under central jurisdiction or state jurisdiction even for a new taxpayer who got registered subsequently or an existing taxpayer who got migrated you can always log into your web you know gst portal and see whether you fall under center or state jurisdiction in your profile so once you fall under center or state jurisdiction the commissionerate who will do audit will be the commissionerate under which you fall under if the so center jurisdiction is the jurisdiction for you the audit has to be conducted by the center only the state cannot exercise jurisdiction to conduct a gst audit vice versa as the case may be if you fall under state jurisdiction only state can conduct gst audit where a center cannot touch you however keep in mind this does not mean that if you fall under center jurisdiction state will never come behind you it is important for us to have some few tips here now so there are if i'm not wrong seven uh, you know departments of state and center who can always exercise jurisdiction over a particular registered person let us count who are this you have let's understand from state jurisdiction you have dggi director general of gst intelligence you have uh, gst uh, center commissioner audit commissionerate you have center range you have center anti evasion uh, which is a wing of the executive commissionerate so you have four jurist four authorities under the center itself then let's come to state state again has audit commissionerate state again has range which we call it as lgsto state also has something called as enforcement which is more similar to anti evasion because it is intelligence based review that they conduct now state has three so center has four authorities state has three authorities so totally we have seven authorities who can at the same time simultaneously exercise jurisdiction over me however the only conflict which we can mitigate is the audit divisions of the both center and the state that means if i fall under center the audit can only be done by center the state audit department cannot you know come and conduct an audit over me and vice versa that means at the same time i could be exposed to six different authorities it's very easy because i keep uh, you know listening this uh, from various uh, tax professionals uh, as well as the you know registered persons that if i am through with the audit i am very happy that that year is concluded let's not do that way assume 1718 audit is concluded that does not mean none of the six or seven authorities come back and come back and ask you any questions the investigation wing of the center or state can always open the issue if there is an information that they get to believe that there is some evasion which is possible or which has happened in your particular uh, register registration they can always open up that issue get into inspection and then investigate the matter and unearth the evasion which they feel which is there however as a consequence of which if they don't find anything well and good however as a part of the investigation if they find out that there was really an evasion which has happened which was non not unearthed during the course of the audit that is again open to courts to you know uh, hear the matter but keep in mind audit is not final conclusion keep also in mind there are six different authorities who can come behind you at any point in time till the time they have a time limit to exercise jurisdiction on you yeah we spoke about this this is important there is something called as cross empowerment even though i said there are six different authorities who can come behind you they cannot come behind you for the same subject matter for the same period that means suppose if the sgst enforcement wing has picked up a matter which they are investigating in uh, in your case for a particular financial year say for example 1718 the center cannot at the same time pick up the same matter for the same year 
they cannot do that because that is cross empowerment which the law you know is is uh, having a particular section to deal with if state is touching upon a matter for a year the center cannot if center is doing that similarly state cannot touch the same matter so this can always be questioned as jurisdiction when a subject matter is already getting investigated or concluded by a particular state office if the center comes in we can always challenge the jurisdiction we spoke about this yeah now who can audit the se section 65 which deals with audit says the commissioner can do an audit or if he is not able to do he can authorize an officer under him to conduct an audit by a general or a specific order now the commissioner has got all the powers could it, it could be state or the center to conduct the audit it is important for us to understand obviously that the commissioner himself cannot come you know conduct the audit and take it to a logical end he will definitely authorize an officer below him could be in the form of acdc or a superintendent to carry on the audit through a general specific order can you ask for the general specific order you may wish to but will it be given to you i have at least not tried practically but if you wish to you can always say, you know ask for an order passed by the commissioner in this regard asking him to authorize who is the officer authorized by him to conduct the audit for your case yeah 65 audit again coming back to the department audit the audit can only be conducted on a registered person that means only if you are a registered person under the gst law department audit can be conducted what if you are an unregistered person there is a separate section to deal with unregistered person section 63 has a scheme of assessment in case of an unregistered person so if you are an unregistered person you will not be subjected to departmental audit under section 65 you will be assessed separately under section 63 65 i'll skip this third point now i'll get into this point in the next slide because that's more interesting there now all through the law if you look at in various section wherever they speak about speak about an officer they have always spoken about a proper officer why is proper officer uh, required because proper officer is the officer who has jurisdiction to act under a particular section that means a show cause notice which gets issued or an asmt which get asmt 10 which gets issued or an audit observation which gets issued or all supposed to be carried out by the proper officer each section has been assigned to a particular level or cadre of an officer few sections have been assigned to a superintendent few sections have been assigned to acdc and above few sections to adc additional commissioner and jc and few to the commissioner so what is assigned to superintendent can always be exercised by the officer higher in rank than him that means if a power is given to superintendent an assistant or a deputy commissioner can definitely exercise that power however if the power is only given to a deputy commissioner and an assistant commissioner a officer below him who is a superintendent cannot exercise that power so it is important for us to understand who is the proper officer for the purpose of audit here that's in the next slide yeah so if you look at i said in the previous slide that the commissioner can authorize a officer below him to conduct an off, uh, conduct the audit now it is important that it is not proper officer who will conduct the audit it is the officer authorized by the commissioner who can conduct the audit that means the commissioner can uh, authorize a superintendent a commissioner can authorize a uh, assistant commissioner a deputy commissioner or as the case may be once he authorizes that person he will only conduct the audit he will conduct the audit but to give observation the powers are only to the proper officer who has got power to issue the observation if you look at the circular 3 bar 2017 it has given power to a assistant commissioner or a deputy commissioner to issue an audit observation a superintendent cannot issue an audit observation even if superintendent was authorized by the commissioner to conduct the audit so let us take a situation the commissioner authorizes superintendent to conduct the audit the superintendent would carry out the audit throughout the phase of the audit however before making the observation the observation have to be discussed with only acdc why acdc only can issue an audit observation so superintendent has no power to issue an audit observation so now foot for thought go back to all the audit observations which you have received from the department look at who has issued the 
audit observation. If in the center, superintendent has issued, that means you have a issue there. That means you can always question the jurisdiction of the officer who is issuing the audit observation. If ACDC has issued, he is well within the powers to issue the audit observation. Second, he issues audit observation. Assume ACDC has only issued the audit observation with his, within his powers. Assess the response, the registered person response. Who can issue ADT2? ADT2, we, we understood that it is an audit closure document. ADT2 again can only be issued by ACDC. ACDC only has got powers to issue ADT2. A superintendent again does not have power to issue ADT2. That means audit observation and the ADT2 to conclude the audit can only be issued by an you know, officer in rank at or above ACDC level, not below that level. Very, very interesting. Once ADT2 is issued, we saw that a show cause notice could get issued for paras which are not accepted by the taxpayer. A show cause notice can be issued by superintendent. So it could so happen that a superintendent carries out the audit during the phase of the audit. Assistant commissioner or a deputy commissioner comes into phase to, into picture to issue an audit observation. I respond to it. He issues the ADT2 to, to close the audit. A superintendent can come back again to issue a show, show cause note in, under section 73 or 74. So in the same case, more than one officer can get involved till the phase of show cause notice. This is what you have to keep in mind. So you'll also always have to look at who is issuing what from the department side. You'll have to always go back to see whether he has jurisdiction to issue that or not. If he does not have jurisdiction, you can always question saying that the notice which should be issued or the observation which has been issued or an ADT2 which has been issued is issued by a person who does not have jurisdiction. If it is not issued by, by the proper person, the notice itself could be called in question and could be quashed at a later stage. Where can be, where can the audit be conducted? This is again a common question which everybody asks. Immediately once an ADT1 comes and the assessee or our client actually forwards the ADT1, general tendency is to say, sir, just ensure that they conduct the audit at their place. They don't come to our premises. We don't want to unnecessarily entertain the departmental officer or the premises. This is generally the type of feedback that we get from the assessees. However, can we really do that? 652 gives power to the authorized officer to conduct the audit either at his own place or at the place of business of the registered person. That means he has got powers to decide where does he want to conduct the audit. It is not that it is at our option to decide where he can conduct the audit. It is at his discretion that he can say where he wants to conduct the audit. Go back to the ADT ones that the department has issued. Always in ADT one, they would give a date and say on that date, I would want to either commence a desk audit, which is at his place, or I would want to commence an audit by coming to your place of business. So that will give you an idea whether he wants to conduct the audit at his place or at my place of business. Important for us to understand. The section says he can conduct audit at the place of business of the registered person. It doesn't say principal place of business of the registered person. That means if I have multiple places of business in the same state, he can choose to do the place audit at any of the places that he wants to. He can do at multiple place if he sees there is a need or he can conclude the audit in one single place, could be principal place or any other place of business. I'm not getting into what is a place of business at this point in time. But when we share this slide, you can always go back to this to understand what does place of business mean. Important for us to understand again now, when does the audit get commenced? We said ADT1 is the commencement of the audit. That actually is not commencement of audit. It is only intimation to say I want to commence audit because ADT1 is only saying that I, I want to come to your place on such and such date, make available such and such document for me to review. However, when does the audit commence? Audit actually commences only from the time I give all the documents which have made, which are being called upon from the department side to the department. That means the annexure which is attached to ADT1, which has list of documents which have to be submitted, only once I tick all those boxes to say all these have been submitted to the department is when the audit really commences. Does it really commence if I give all documents? No, the commencement date says it is later of two events. One event is giving all the documents which the auditor calls for. Second is basically he starts his audit at the place of business of the assessee or the registered person. 
whichever is later. That means even if I give him all the documents, if he is not commencing his audit at my place of business, if he wishes to, the audit is not deemed to be commenced as per the law. Again, there is the each year. Catch this. It says actual institution of audit at the place of business. What, what if he is starting or is wishing to do his audit from his desk? The law says date on which the records are made available or the actual institution of audit at the place of business. If he is doing a desk audit, I would say that once you give all the documents which he is asking for, that itself is the commencement of the audit. Very important for us to you know, uh, understand that. How do I prove on record that all the documents which is called for is made available? This is where it is very important for us to document everything for a future reference. If you are providing any details to the department, kindly draft a covering letter saying that you call for 10 documents. I am giving you these 10 documents by virtue of this covering letter, by virtue of the annexures to this covering letter. If one or two points are not attended to or require more time, you should always mention there saying that these details will be submitted in due course of time. And subsequently make it a point that when you're submitting those to balance details, make again a covering letter, draw attention to the first letter saying that all the first eight points were already attended to, only two points were pending. I have given you the balance two points now. So all the documents which were required to commence the audit have been commenced. So thereby I understand audit is already commenced from your perspective. Why is this crucial? You will get this point when I talk about completion of audit in the subsequent slide. At this point in time, keep in mind, audit gets commenced only once you give all the documents which are called for as part of the audit. This is not additional documents which they call for. The initial documents which they have called for should be made available to the department only then the audit commences. So now, we said that the audit is commenced now. Important for us to understand what are the documents which the department can call for. They cannot just call for whatever they feel like. They have to call for documents which is under their purview and which is permitted under the uh, under the law. We section 35 of the GST law says that what are the accounts and records which a taxpayer is required to maintain under the law. Quite obviously, we saw the definition of audit to see that what can you verify is the documents and records which are required to be maintained under the law. That means the documents and records which you can call for under the purview of the GST law are the documents and records which are required to be maintained under section 35. So what are the documents and records which are required to be maintained under section 35 are these on slide. I'm not discussing more. It predominantly revolves around if you're a manufacturer, Quite obviously, your inventory records and the production details. If you are a trader, your stock of goods and the rest. If you are a service provider, nothing really specific unless you are a works contractor where you require to maintain details at project level. Uh, so what are the details? We spoke about production and manufacturing details. We spoke about stock and inventory details. Quite obviously, you have to maintain your inward and outward summary of uh, goods and supply services which you are procuring as well as supplying, the credits that you have availed, the credits that you have reversed, the taxes that you have paid, and the taxes that are required to be paid as per the books of accounts, and the advances that you have received, because advances are taxable that we know in case of services. So every advance you receive, every advance you adjust, have also required to be maintained separately. So these are the set of details which are required to be maintained in section 35. We know. The scope of audit is quite quite broad. They cannot restrict themselves to what is said in section 35. They can always go beyond that. Why? Because we said the documents and records maintained and furnished under this law or any other law for the time being in force. So that is where you see lot of times the department can also ask for ITR copies. Lot of times the department can also ask for form 26 as and like. Why? Because those are the documents and details which are furnished under some other law, which are time being enforced. Means you also have to ensure that when you are maintaining records, all these are in line with each other, all these are synchronized with each other, and all these documents speak the same thing. Because if they find out something which is there in ITR, not there in GST records, or if they find out something in 26 A's, which is there in 26 A's, but not there in, not there in uh, GST records, that could always form part of their observation. So it is very essential for us to ensure that ITR, 26 A's, GST records and all the allied records which you maintain for other laws are all speaking the same terms. In terms of documents, we know what all we maintain. We maintain invoice, bill of supply, debit note, credit note, receipt and payment voucher and likes. So these are again the documents and records which gets generated as part of the GST law. 
as uh, as part of the gst law on every transaction that we undertake another important thing which we have to understand is the documents which are required to be maintained under the law need not be specifically maintained physically it is also permitted to be maintained electronically that means if you maintain the documents electronically the law says that such documents which are maintained electronically should be accessible to every place of business to which it relates to so it's a, it's generally what happens is the accounts and records could be maintained at the corporate level you might also have a factory or a go down or a place of business other than the corporate office in the same state the accounts and records may not be maintained at each of the places of business thereby it could be electronically maintained at the corporate office the law permits that to happen however each of the place of business that your factory go down or any other place of business from where the sale or the purchase happens through that place you should be able to access such electronically maintained records for the for the documents and records which pertaining pertains to those additional places of business so obviously if you maintain corporate documents for every place of business the every place of business need not have access to every other place of business documents it only has to have access to that place of business uh, documents relating to that place of business another point is should i maintain a trial balance for each state separately assume you are a taxpayer having multiple registrations in multiple states should you maintain trial balance for each of the states separately the law in no place requires you to maintain a trial balance separately for each registration it only says what are the accounts and records which are required to be maintained for each registered person means if you are maintaining those accounts and records that is your inventory records your production records your inward and outward summary tax paid summary input tax paid summary advance summary that is sufficient for from your perspective to demonstrate that what is required under the law is indeed been maintained by me he cannot call in question that you have not maintained a separate trial balance for each of the registration separately a trial balance can be for the entity the accounts and records in terms of documents that we spoke about has to be separately for each of each of the registration okay so now we understood who can do audit what are the documents which are essential for the conduct of the audit now we'll see during the course of the audit when the department starts reviewing and makes up its paragraph in terms of observation what kind of observations that have we come across through our experience from output side from input side and from reverse chart side so we have just tried to demonstrate and put here few points which we see is a general point which gets picked up during the course of audit so first point is basically a reconciliation from the output side the foremost thing which any officer proper officer will call for is the reconciliation between your turnover as per books of accounts and the turnover that you have disclosed with gstr returns so it is very usual you are, it is usual that this kind of information gets called for it is also pertinent to note that this is already a document which should be made available by you to your person who is dealing with your you know gst records why because while filing 9 or while filing 9c or for that matter while filing monthly returns you have to reconcile your turnover as per books with the turnover that you want to disclose with the gst uh, gst uh, authorities so thereby the primary document which anybody will vouch for is a document which reconciles your output tax as well as your turnover with your books of accounts with the turnover as disclosed in the gst returns so any difference between these two records will straight away become a paragraph for the departmental officer to uh, put it into your audit observation second in uh, information which uh, second observation which uh, generally gets made by the department is there are lot of credits to the payendal which are unanswered so those credits is what the department asks for as to what are those credits for we may not have disclosed that as a turnover for the gst purposes well taken but we have to demonstrate and you know showcase to the department why such credits into my pnl should not be considered as a turnover for gst and uh, why is that uh, taxes on that need not be paid on such credits so what, which are such credits which we generally see uh, we generally see credits from suppliers we generally see credits from customers what are these credits it could be in the form of discounts it could be in form of uh, incentives it could be a form of credit note which are given given by suppliers or for that matter my customers so if you have taken a tax position we are not getting into a tax position discussion today if you have taken a tax position that these credits 
from my suppliers are not supplies under gst then you should be able to demonstrate that through documentation that a secondary discount or an incentive or a credit note is not a supply under the gst law and thereby taxes on that have not been paid by the registered person the third of the points which generally gets picked up as part of the uh, departmental audit is cross charge i am sure by now we, uh, we are six, in sixth year of the uh, uh, from the introduction of the uh, gst law everybody here present would know what does cross charge mean we are not delving into what is cross charge especially if you have more than one registration uh, which have taken under the gst law by default department believes that there is a requirement to cross charge some bit of cost from the main uh, registration which is your corporate office to the other branches situated outside the state assume you are present in the state and the audit is getting picked up for a state where there is a corporate office by default department believes saying that cost which are common to the entity as a whole should not rest only with the you know corporate office it has to be distributed across all the branches including the corporate office itself in some form which is uh, scientific in nature acceptable to you acceptable to the department so thereby if you have taken a position that cross charge is not applicable to you because the branches are self sustained that is they can sustain on their own and the corporate office does not support branch in any form then how do you demonstrate this to the department becomes very crucial department by default believes in case of multiple registration the corporate office supports the branch office in various forms and there has to be a cross charge done if there is no cross charge done they do their best judgment to the extent of what they believe should be the cross charge it could be turnover based it could be uh, employee based it could be any form that they believe is right and then they believe that should be the cross charge which should have been done from uh, registration 1 to registration 2 please ensure if there are multiple registration you make up a write up to explain why cross charge is whether required or not required if you've done explain how have we done if you have not done explain why is it not required to be done in your case there have also been multiple cases where frequent amendments in rates have happened right from the introduction of gst till date there have been enough amendments and notification which have been issued for change in rates for goods and services if your products have gone through multiple change in rates gone department while doing audit they generally have tendency to look at the current rate and compare to the previous rates that you have charged in 17 18 18 19 assume the current rate of tax for your product is 18% and in the first year it was 5% the tendency of the department to say it is 18% today why have you not done 18% for 17 18 so you should be prepared with the notification under which that was taxable at 5 or 12% as the case may be and when did the under, uh, rate got uh, get under undergo a change from 5 or 12 to 18 and demonstrate to the office officer saying that it was 5 or 12 back then and hence you have charged 5 or 12 as the case may be in the year 17 18 or 18 19 today it is 18 this rate is not applicable for the earlier period advances again uh, when you go into the financial statements which you submit as part of the audit there is a tendency for the department officer to look at the advances which are sitting in your current liabilities and say there are advances disclosed in uh, in in the returns uh, in the financial statements have you paid taxes on this if yes show me where it is if not why should you not pay taxes on this so you should be very clear you know very clever to explain this very clearly to demonstrate whether the advances are on goods or advances are on services if advances are for goods you know that advances for goods are not taxable only advances for services are taxable you should be able to demonstrate whether the advances are for goods or services and accordingly make your presentation to say why you have paid tax or why you have not paid tax exempt income if your turnover is subjected to tax at say 18% department has no problem because they believe that every turnover is taxed at the marginal rate so no further questions to ask however if the turnover is exempted you have to have reasons to explain which notification exempts your goods or services and what are the conditions if at all there are conditions attached to the exemption and how you how do you demonstrate that conditions spelled out there are indeed met or not through documentation similar is the case with concessional rate concessional rate is basically the rate of tax is 18% there is a notification to give a concessional rate of tax from 18 to say 5 or 12 or a partial uh, you know exemption to the rate 
you have to demonstrate which notification gives you this concession. Couple of points I'm skipping, which are there on the slide, which are self-explanatory. We'll get into the next slide, which speaks more about ITC now. Receipt of goods. When it comes to ITC, we know that, or through experience, we know now that major questions which get you know uh, issued or with major questions that come from the department side devolve around input tax. So anything to do with input tax, department feel there could be something wrong there. So you have to demonstrate how the conditions for claiming the input tax credit. That's it. That is, you have the invoice, you have received the goods or services, you have made the payment to the vendor, you have filed your returns, he has filed the returns and paid the taxes are demonstrated. Last point I'll come to a little bit later, but at least the first four points had to be demonstrated very evidently and clearly to the satisfaction of the officer that the credit claimed have all passed through these four parameters before the claim is made in the 3B. Many a times now we have seen that this 180 days criteria is taken very loosely. We claim credit, but forget to demonstrate that we have made the payment to the vendor within 180 days. You have to have a payment column in your ITC statement to demonstrate that payment to the vendor indeed is made within 180 days. In the absence of which the department feels that the payment is not made and they generally disallow the credit or ask for reversal of credit. Then we have a uh, next three a couple of points which demonstrates more on the exempted uh, turnover side. If you have sale of securities or if you have sale of land and building from the GST law perspective, even though securities and land and buildings are outside the scope of GST law, law believes a percentage of the credits have to be reversed considering the sale of securities and land and building as exempt only for the purpose of reversal of ITC. So just ensure if you have any sale of securities or land and building, that particular adherence to the particular provision under the law is made and complied with. If not, a question could come from uh, the department side asking for reversal of input tax credit. The next point is wherever you have paid tax under RCM and claim credit of, ensure especially if you, such credits are rather such payments are made on account of unregistered procurements, you have generated self invoice. Say, for example, you have taken services of a lawyer who is unregistered. Lawyer services are covered under 93 or 53 as the case may be. So once you pay tax for claiming the credit on the payments made under RCM, the document which are essential is self invoice and the challenge on which you pay tax. So self invoice is very crucial. GSTR 2A3B. We know that uh, circular 183 has been issued in December covering the period 17, 18, 18, 19 to say that even if the items are not appearing in GSTR 2A, if you're able to give me a declaration from the supplier to say that taxes on this invoice have been paid, that is sufficient for me to consider that uh, the credit on uh, the invoice on which you claim credit is all eligible. So for us, it is important to demonstrate for the purpose of audit to see the line items which are not appearing in 2A and reach out to the vendor to see if we can get a declaration from him to say that he has by mistake shown B2B as B2C or instead of putting my GSTN number, he has put some other GSTN number, but taxes which are there on the invoice have indeed been remitted to the department on time. So that document will enable you to produce before the officer to make him or allow him to flow through the input tax credit and not disallow the same. Two points I'm skipping because of paucity of time. I will pick up points which are crucial. Because I have five more minutes to close from my side. These are general points. You, these are self-explanatory. You can always go through. You can always raise this as a question if you have something specific. Yeah, I'll dwell on this for two minutes. RCM. Keep this in mind. For 17, 18, Till October uh, 13, October 13 to uh, October 9, 2017, any procurements from unregistered person was subjected to tax under Section 94. Department will call for details of unregistered procurements. They will want to check whether have you paid tax under 94. If not, they would want to demand that now as part of the audit. Please do your homework to ensure that any un unregistered procurements have all been suffered to tax or if you're taking an argument that the omission which came from October 2017 is to be read as omitted from day one, then 
you have a litigation route to take because department may not agree to that uh, you know argument so you should be ready for litigation however if you already paid taxes under 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 rcm for unregistered procurement make your computation to see whether all unregistered procurements have all suffered tax similar is the case with all foreign payments foreign payments the one basic thing which they are asking for is give me details wherever you have done tds under 195 that's a trigger point for them to verify whether all foreign payments have suffered rcm so if you have done tds they want you to demonstrate whether rcm on that has to be paid or not so you can reconcile your 195 section tds which you have deducted vis a vis the rcm payments that you made for 195 uh, under import of services ocean freight we know we have supreme court judgment now to say tax on ocean freight cannot be demanded so matter is uh, uh, the department has not filed an appeal against the department uh I, I, i not file against the decision of the supreme court so matter finally rests now ocean freight should not be taxable wherever department have already issued notice or are taking up this paragraph you can always give the judgment which is passed by the supreme court we saw various points which came up now i am skip i am only spending a minute on this department cannot indefinitely carry on audit they have time limit of 3 months from the commencement of audit to conclude the audit now you have to understand what does commencement mean we spoke about commencement in four slides behind to say whenever you make available all the documents which are called for initially that is the commencement of audit from such date they have to complete audit within 3 months that can be further extended but not beyond 6 months that means 3 plus 3 is what is permissible with the approval of the commissioner they cannot go beyond 6 months overall audit has to be commenced within 6 months completed within 6 months if they don't complete you can always question saying that audit is not concluded you understood it to be concluded at the end of 6 months or 3 months as the case may be and argue on those lines we spoke about this point yeah now assume on completion of audit based on the observation made there are liabilities which the officer believes is demandable from you he makes an observation assume you accept the liability which has been uh, portrayed in the audit observation you are required to pay that either in cash or by utilization of credit using drc03 if you don't agree to that the matter will go into show cause notice you can always get the matter into litigation if you believe what is demanded by the department is not to be demanded the litigation route is always open but to the responses to the audit observation which is there kindly keep it very brief don't give your reply like a reply to show cause notice that is if the department gives you an audit observation which you agree to it's very easy to say which accepted and have paid to drc03 if you do not accept to keep your response to bare minimum as possible do not give case loss do not give uh, too much of detail to say that why do you believe it is not taxable you can probably say the para paragraph made is not acceptable to me for 1 2 3 4 just in a just reasons and that is enough for you to respond to the observation once it gets into show cause notice when you can make a detailed submission of your responses to say why you believe what is made as a uh, you know a para in the uh, show cause notice is not demandable from you this is what i said this is not required i'll get into the last slide yeah now as part of the observation there are various observations which the department makes few things are fact based few things are interpretative based few things is something which you cannot do anything department cannot do anything something which are fact based should always be given back along with the facts which are possible to be given so that they can drop the paragraph at the audit stage itself few things are for exports if they call for firc you can always provide firc because those are facts fact documents which are ready available by giving firc or shipping bills the audit officer can always drop the paragraph on exports rcm on director's remuneration if the remuneration is in the form of salary you can always demonstrate that through form 16 these are again fact documents you give form 16 it is easy for him to drop the paragraph saying rcm is not applicable because that's in the form of salary similar as they are the cases with next three points there next are interpretation based what are interpretation based he believes that itc is not used in the course of business you believe that it is in the course of business so it's again a subject matter of interpretation so wherever that is interpretative in nature you give your interpretation to the extent what is required at the level of audit stage you don't give all your trump card at the audit level that means if you believe tax has to be uh, uh, itc has to be made eligible in your hands for 10 reasons don't go explaining the 10 reasons at the audit level 
you give in a jest why you believe credit should be eligible in your hands let the auditor decide whether that uh, interpretation of yours is acceptable at the audit stage or not if he accepts well and good if not he'll give a show cause notice you anyways have 10 points to explain in detail at the show cause level to say what all made you believe that it is it is eligible in your hands problem of giving everything now means you're opening up your trump card at the audit level so he will ensure that the show cause when he is drafting takes care of all the 10 points which are your arguments at the show cause level at the audit stage itself so i would suggest give what is required at the audit stage retain what is required to be explained at the show cause level at the show cause stage i have given certain examples for interpretation based issues disputes if you are a person who are situated in karnataka you will be able to relate to the first three points which is there on the slide Depa especially the state departments are raising issues on corporate guarantees credit guarantee granting services and holding and subsidiary services i am not explaining what these are even if you explain to the department why these are not to be taxable by giving how much ever write up to the department they cannot help but give you a show cause notice because those are points on which they have very clear understanding internally that they have to issue notice so there is no use of giving all write ups on corporate guarantee on credit granting services on holding and subsidiary explaining why it should not be taxable at audit stage because we know that show cause is inevitable let the show cause come you can always pick it up at the show cause to explain in detail as to why you believe these three items are not taxable okay so now we have understood what is audit who can do audit when can the audit get commenced how does the audit get commenced what happens during the course of audit how does the audit get concluded and what kind of issues come out of audit so now i had few tips which i wanted to you know share it with you before i conclude the session because these tips are tips which i've learned during the course of handling multiple audits over the period of last one one and a half years i thought i'll share it with you uh, there are many more but whatever i could uh, you know think about for this session is what i've put on this slide i'll take you through one by one generally the tendency is to be conservative many a times during the course of audit to buy peace with the department conservative approach need not always be buying peace to the department because many times if you become conservative and pay up taxes it could lead to something which could be lost to you for example assume you are in, in in a in a uh, you know uh, healthcare sector inpatient pharmacy sales department believes is taxable assume you give buy into that argument of the department and pay up taxes the credit which you have claimed on this could be a challenge so take a measured view don't just go by what department is saying to to buy peace and avoid litigation by by buying peace you are also you know uh, proceed i mean you are also accepting the point that future also i'll do this that means whatever they are saying you have to also carry on in the future transactions so those repercussions also to be considered while deciding uh, take while taking a conservative during the course of audit second point is linked to that think of precedents that you create by accepting to certain things which the audit is pointing at if you think today you will accede to the point which the audit officer is making think that you are creating a precedence for yourself in the future so today if audit says holding shares in subsidiary is taxable please pay tax and by virtue of the value being very small today you accede that and accept and pay up taxes going forward if the value of such transaction becomes very huge you have already set precedence for yourself in the previous year by paying up taxes so it is always better to set precedence than to become conservative and pay up the taxes considering the value is very small do not forget to claim benefit legally available say during the course of audit the department says certain tra transactions are taxable say under rcm if he demands under 74 weigh your option of claiming the credit even now i'm not getting into how can you claim credit there is a available uh, no window open to claim credit on itc played even during the course of uh, uh, the audit if the demand is under section 73 weigh your options pay up the taxes don't leave the uh, no benefit available under the law please claim generally we miss out on this point but do not uh, you know miss out on if something is legally available on the taxes which are paid on on account of audit please make those uh, lodge those claims and pay, make those claims second thing which i can think about is assume a transaction which you have paid as igst during the uh, during the course of 1718 is held as cgst sgst in the audit when you make cgst sgst payment today 
you are eligible to claim the refund of the IGST which you have wrongfully paid in the earlier year. So that benefit which of which is available under the law, you should not miss out on. People generally forget by paying the correct taxes and not claiming the wrong tax adjustment paid. What I'm saying is you still have two years from today to lodge a claim for the refund of the wrong taxes which you paid in 1718. It is not two years from 1780. It is two years from the time it is held that CGST, SGST is payable and not IGST. So thereby on conclusion of audit, if you paid the correct taxes, claim back the wrong taxes which you paid to the government in the earlier years. This third, fourth point we, sp we spoke earlier. Whenever you make submissions, kindly ensure those are written submissions. Also, those are kindly uh, du duly acknowledged by the department. Why? Because those documents come in handy if the matter goes into litigation. These could become evidences for you for future litigation. So kindly ensure submissions are on record, acknowledged by the department, or are, are also on record for future evidences to take on account. Also, whenever you produce yourself before the department for submission of documents or for a hearing, ensure proceedings are on record. That means whatever you have discussed during the course of the hearing is put down on a piece of paper. Officer signs, you sign. You get a copy of it. The file, the document which is their record goes into the file. Your document comes into your uh, file so that this becomes a proceeding for future reference to say this is what I had told during the course of hearing so that he does not say otherwise in conclusion of audit or while issuing show cause notice. Also, generally the tendency is to give more information than what is called for. I am not saying give wrong information. Give the correct information to the extent what is called for. In haste, don't give more information. More information is not good because the more information which you are giving might lead to something else which he is not expecting you to give information for. So what is asked for is what is required to be given. What is not asked for, don't have to be overly cautious to give more. Okay, that is one more point which I wanted to share. Also, your responses to the audit observation, keep it brief. We told this earlier also, don't make it lengthy. Don't give your trump card at this point in time. Don't make SCN reply style uh, you know, submissions at the audit observation stage. Keep it brief, keep it apt, respond to the point, leave it to it. If the officer believes it is right, he will drop it. If he's not able to understand, he will obviously take it to the next level. Why am I saying this? Do not, in the haste of getting the paras closed during the course of audit, push on documents to you know make the officer close the audit here with dropping the para. There is something called as revisionary powers with the office, with the department. What is revisionary? If the commissioner believes tomorrow or the revisionary authority believes tomorrow, any officer subordinate to him has taken any decision. Mind you, decision includes intimation. Intimation means ADT2 is also an intimation. If in an intimation, there is a decision taken by the officer which is detrimental to the revenue. That means some para which was revenue earning uh, para was dropped by the officer because of the way he looked at it, uh, he closed it, can be reopened by a revisionary authority. So if something is closed today, does not mean it is closed for eternity. That can always be reopened by the revisionary authority in a, on a future date based on a decision taken by the officer on a current date. That means during the course of audit, if the audit officer through your submission is able to drop something on record, does not mean he's dropping for eternity. That can always be challenged by a revisionary authority to say he is not taken everything on record while deciding the matter. So ADT2 is not final. It can always be reopened in a future date. Courts will obviously look at whether ADT2 itself was a decision by the officer or not. Currently, for conservative sake, let us understand ADT2 is also, an, is also a decision taken by the officer. So anything he has decided in an ADT2 to drop a para, that means is decided on record that can always be reopened if that is prejudicial or detrimental to the revenue. If you are paying taxes or if you are willing to pay taxes, kindly take decision early. Don't wait for notice and uh, wait for notice to lapse. Uh, I mean, 30 days to lapse for notice because if you pay within 30 days of the show cause notice, the waiver of penalty can always be sought. If 30 days goes by from the show cause notice, penalty provisions kick in and the respective penalty 10%, 25%, or 15% or as the case may be kick in. So if you are okay to pay up taxes because you believe taxes are correctly charged by the department, pay up as early as possible so that penalty can be reduced.
this is a slide to say till when can the orders be passed under or the notices can be issued under uh, uh, respective sections for 17 18 18 19 and so on for 17 18 the due date for issuing the notice under the normal period is 30th september due date for or passing the order is 31st december if they get into evasion if they you know invoke evasion they have time till august 2024 and february 2025 to issue notice and order accordingly 18 19 19 20 are on the slides so you can always go go back to this slide to understand when are the due dates yeah, this is what i wanted to share i think i, I overshot by 10 minutes so i will allow people to ask questions if there are any questions and for the next 10 15 minutes we can take up kindly see there is a qr code on the slide we have a community on whatsapp where we keep uh, you know sharing updates we'll also be sharing this ppt on that community people who wish to get into that community who are already on the community no problem if people who are not in the community if they wish to get into the community to get uh, gst updates from us they can always scan this qr code and uh, be part of the community now we can get into questions if you have uh, any you have to type in the questions there are certain questions in the chat box i am just going to that can the superintendent issue scn directly after issuing audit enquiry generally no the process which is followed is after audit enquiry i will be given an opportunity to respond i will respond to the audit enquiry the audit enquiry has to convert into adt2 then only the audit gets concluded once the audit is concluded is when the show cause notice gets issued have we come across a situation where audit enquiry is directly resulted into show cause notice i have def i have at least not come across such situation and i do not believe that is the right process to be followed by the departmental officer they have to conclude the audit and then only issue a show cause notice next question is endorsement is issued for audit of 2 years what is the difference between edt1 and endorsement endorsement is only a document in, uh, informing you certain information which they want to inform you it is not initiation of audit audit always gets initiated through adt1 an endorsement could be post adt1 suppose adt1 is issued you have not submitted documents to intimate you that you have not submitted documents state departments generally issue something called as endorsement so endorsement is only after adt1 it will generally not be before adt1 because before adt1 there is nothing called as commencement of audit if there is no commencement of audit endorsement has no real uh, legal backing so i would say endorsement comes much later after adt1 probably uh, after adt1 if you don't respond or probably after audit observation if you don't respond is when endorsement comes into picture can the department reopen the audit after it is completed there is nothing called as reopening of audit unlike uh, you know so motor review under uh, vat law there is something called as revisionary powers which i spoke about in my last slide revisionary authority is an authority who can review the decisions or the orders passed by the officers lower in rank than the revisionary authority to see whether they have passed the orders or taken a decision appropriately to the interest of the revenue if they feel that something is not take a decision or the order which is passed is not rightly passed or not rightly decided they can always review the decision or the order by going through the records and putting me to the notice by issuing a show cause notice separately there is no reopening of audit but review of the audit is definitely possible next question is uh, can cross charge for previous year that is 18 19 19 20 be paid now and credit claimed by the recipient state there is nothing to stop you from doing this but by doing this beware that uh, one if this happens after the audit is initiated they will ensure that this goes into 74 once 74 is initiated credit cannot be claimed basis of demand made under 74 if you look at section 17 5 a credit cannot be made by virtue of a demand under section 74 that means by virtue of 74 if you are making a cross charge today by raising an invoice on your branch the branch cannot claim credit on the basis of invoice 
where the tax is demanded under section 74 if it's 73 still you can venture into but if it's 74 you cannot but probably if you are little clever before the audit is concluded and uh, before uh, during the proceeding you know that the department is trying to make a point on cross charge you issue an invoice ensure that it comes in gst or 1 and 3b now and passes into 3b of the other I mean, 2a of the other party you may try to venture into but the other person's uh, you know jurisdictional officer also has to allow this because it will, if you mention this is for 18 19 19 20 the officer of the uh, jurisdictional uh, officer of the recipient state could always question saying that these are all credits of 18 19 19 20 i will not give you credit in 22 23 but you have the right to challenge it obviously take it to the logical end uh, through litigative route but very challenging you'll have to wait and watch for the courts to decide on this but if you ask me is it possible certainly possible is there a bar in the law there is no bar in the law what is bar is any demand under 74 credit of that to the recipient is not allowed or 1718 refund claimed in jan 20 during gst audit officer is asking for reversing the credit a refund is there any circular permitting the refund i am not able to fully understand the question maybe if you can just uh, mr giri if you can elaborate that question a little bit it will give me more insights next question how to challenge adt2 issued by superintendent there is uh, issued by superintendent so once a show cause notice is issued by the superintendent under 74 he will say that he is issuing show cause notice based is the adt2 which is issued by, you know under section 657 so 656 now if his basing is show cause notice on the adt2 the adt2 adt2 is issued by superintendent who does not have jurisdiction so you can always question the jurisdiction of the basis of the show cause notice issued if adt2 adt2 is the basis for show cause notice you can challenge the basis for issuing the show cause notice notice itself through jurisdiction is there any due date where the officer has to drop down the notice issued under asmt 10 after providing all the documents since asmt 10 is not the subject for discussion today i am not taking up this question this can always be taken up in a separate uh, gathering igst invoice wrongly reported as cgst scst what can be done before audit done before audit you can always hold it to be igst pay up the correct taxes and claim the wrong taxes paid section 77 gives you immunity for under for interest under for this penalty can definitely be you know uh, argued to say no penalty because taxes have been paid refund under section 54 allows you to claim refund of the wrong taxes paid Harish question GST registration my GST registration is on central rolls can audit under 65 6 be taken up by state or vice versa or can i respond to state that i am on rolls of center definitely certainly yes sir if you are under the jurisdiction of the center and if state is trying to pick up the uh, audit for you you can always write back to them saying that you are under central jurisdiction and the central jurisdiction has to conduct the audit uh, if at all they wish to and not the state jurisdiction audit completed 1718 18, 1819 but annual returns not filed can department ask for annual returns and levy penalty certainly yes because if you look at the definition of audit or any compliances under the provisions of the law so that allows them to get into to understand whether have you done compliance under the law wherever required correctly or not if you have not done it correctly they can always levy penalty for non compliance of a particular uh, non action in this case you have not filed annual returns one is late fee is definitely permissible second is the penalty for non compliance uh, of the uh, return non filing of the returns can also be demanded from you we have got notice under 10 asmt 10 for difference in 2a 3b is it sufficient to provide the declaration as per circular 183 we discussed yes 183 circular permits you to submit a declaration from your vendors audit done by central authority but state enforcement issued notice for 2a 3b difference and rcm availed and declared mismatch is it questionable to state authority if audit had picked up this paragraph during the course of audit that there is a difference between 2a 3b then you can always rely on the cross empowerment which we discussed to say that this proceeding on this matter for this year is already been picked up during the course of audit by center and uh, the state authorities cannot lay their hands on this particular matter for that period again and make a submission accordingly 
when is gst appellate tribunal likely to be formed we are also waiting eagerly because a lot of cases are waiting you know pending uh, after judgment of the uh, first level at, uh, you know appellate authority hopefully by end of this year or early next year is where i think the tribunal could be formed so yeah so a lot of pendency before the tribunal now so once it is formed a lot of matters will go into appeal and god knows when the our matters will come up for hearing yeah these were the questions uh, i think i've taken all of it only mr giri has to send a mail to us separately which i will add, attend to otherwise i think i have taken all the questions uh, i think yes yeah this is what i think we had to share today uh, thank you so much for participating and we would want you to you know continue to shower uh, blessings on us and uh, attend all our sessions which are there in the future as well uh, i would request everybody to you know uh, join our community and uh, make it a bigger one so that we can uh, you know give you more and more insights about uh, gst on a continuous basis i'm putting the slide again of the qr code people who were not able to access earlier could uh, access now to join our uh, whatsapp community thank you again thank you so much